You know, it really feels like Science Friday today. I'm Jay Fidel. It's Friday. It's healthcare in Hawaii with Malcolm Ng, MD, uh, and on the faculty of the John A. Burns School of Medicine. We're going to talk about uh, uh, electronics that deal with pain. <coughs> Welcome to the show, Malcolm. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Jay. Great to have you. <clears throat> so tell us a little about your background and what you're doing these days. And we only have half an hour, so don't take too much time. <coughs> I will be uh, very brief. When I was in medical school at Yale School of Medicine, graduated from there, we were assigned to do a thesis. I chose my thesis to work under a fellow named Dr. Harold Saxton Burr. Dr. Burr is known as the father of electrical field biology. In other words, he felt that all living organisms were actually consisting of an electrical field where the molecules would come and go, but the field would be there as a pattern or a form to give it a continuity and action. So he made many, many measurements with electrical field measurements. And I happened to choose him as my thesis advisor mm -hmm. at Yale University School of Medicine. Mm -hmm. In those days, we concentrated on what, what kinds of electrical activity were accompanying various functions. One of the things he found, for instance, there was a big shift in the electrical field when um, a mammal ovulated. And he was particularly interested in that. He could prove it because he had animals that could be measured. They could, you could measure the electrical field in the animal and also correlate it with ovulation. This was one of his primary interests. But he had other fields of inter, uh, interest. One of the fields that fascinated me was a paper that he produced with animal study in which the animals were developing tumors. They were genetically programmed to develop tumors on their abdomens, on their chests. Now with his instrumentation, he could pick up a change in what they call the direct current potential on the chest wall of these animals, mark that animal at that point, and then right there was where the tumor developed. So there was a change in voltage on that animal that manifested itself in a tumor. This is, this is very advanced, you might say, in terms of our understanding now. I mean, these are the days before magnetic ray imaging, before a lot of the EEG material came out. I mean, this is way back. We're talking over 50 years. Let me clarify one thing. So yeah. when, the, when the voltage changed on, yeah. the, on that animal, animal, that would tell you there would be a tumor, or yes. it would tell you there was, in there, fact, a tumor? There would be a tumor. The That's tumors incredible. were not there at that time. Ah. So here's what he, his postulate was that if you were able to measure electrical signals from the human or any living organism, you would be able to predict its health, you would be able to predict when tumors develop and when there was a lack of health. There was, there was that correlation. However, you might say that this was all in the diagnostic category the diagnostic category, rather than a treatment category. Yeah. So one of the most amazing experiments that I saw that he had performed was uh, predicting where the first cleavage of an a of, of the embryo, or uh, the egg of an embryo would develop. And he could also predict, for instance, where the notochord, which is a spinal cord of that organism, by taking electrical measurements on, on this <coughs> organism, he would predict where the spinal cord would develop. So there was a lot of correlation with what I call diagnostics. It's extraordinary. Yeah, it is. I mean, and you can, I can find yep. cel cellular activity. Cellular activity. Different yeah. kinds of activity, different, different parts of the body, different yep. processes. Were, were reflected so, in his electrical measurements. How come we haven't heard about this? Well, it kind of got buried <laughs> because, <laughs> because medicine moved toward drugs and surgery rather than any of this other very potential I would say, potentially helpful material. Sure. And it kind of lay dormant for many years. It was in uh, my, I will bring up my introduction to when the electronics really became important to me. At one time, 2003, I was out surfing on the island in Maui. And I had actually uh, been injured in my knee. My knee had struck the coral I sort of assumed that it was okay, I cleaned it up, but three days later I had a raging infection in my knee, 
and I was treated by an orthopedic surgeon here in Honolulu, and he drained fluid off of it, and fortunately it hadn't reached the joint by the time I got high dose into antibiotics. So my knee was treated, the affection was over, but here's what happened. Three weeks later, I'm on Maui again, and this was at another medical meeting, and I was out with my favorite board at one of the breaks, and I tried to make a turn. Uh, all surfers use their knees to make the turns. So I cranked a turn, as they say, and I fell right off the board. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this knee is not working. It was my right knee, and I remember it distinctly, and I think, what is going on? So the infection was gone, but my knee was not functioning in normally. Now, just fortuitously, that evening, I had watched these program. I was a, one of the instructors on the program, but I'd seen a, a listing of another instructor named Dr. Gerald Tennant from Dallas, who I knew as a retired ophthalmologist. And he was teaching a course or having a workshop on what he called energetic medicine, and I had no idea what this was. But I walked up to him at that uh, cocktail party, and I talked to him a little bit. I said, Jerry, what... What is this energetic medicine? What, what are you talking about here? And he says, well, do you know Dr. McFarland over there? And I said, well, I know him you know, by name. I don't know him personally. He says, well, three days ago, he came in to, uh, he and I met, and he said he had a very bad tennis elbow, and he wasn't able to play his favorite sport, tennis. And I treated him with an electrical instrument. And I said, kind of facetiously, I asked him, I said, well, Jerry, if you can fix an elbow with this electronic system, can you fix a knee? I'm kind of like joking here, right? Because I had this vivid memory of what was happening to my knee that afternoon. And he said, you know, let's try it. Tomorrow morning, I want you to come to my suite and we'll treat you. So the next morning, not knowing anything about any of this at all previously, I was treated by him. And he had a Russian instrument called the Skanar. S-C-E-N-A-R. That instrument was what he had been using for treatment over a year period because he had found out about that instrument and actually gone and been trained by uh, one of the instructors who knew how to use the instrument and then they assigned him to be an instructor for the whole United States. He was the only licensed instructor. And he had this instrument. He put it on my knee and he, he kept running up the, there was a little button he was pressing and he said, can you feel that? I said, no. Can you feel that? No. And finally, I said, oh, I feel that. And then he sort of just ran across the knee with this instrument with the electrode. And about 10 minutes later, he says, well, that's about it. And I said, that's it? That You treated me now? That's, that's the end of it? And he says, yeah, I, I checked the field, and the field has changed, so you're all ready to use the knee again. <laughs> no. I was totally skeptical. I mean, like, this is far out, but I'm going to go out and try it the next day. So I went out to the break. Same break, same board, same kind of waves. And I got up, I caught the wave, and I cranked the turn immediately back, forth, back and forth. I was back to normal. In one session, my knee was functioning back the way it was. Well, let's, let's stop there. So let, what, that was what got Medically, my what was wrong with your knee? Well, here's what I think was wrong. Although infection was finished and gone, there was a, a lack of proper innervation, proper function of the muscles and the tendons at that area, even though the infection was gone. So it was a residual been effect. damaged. The infection damage in had the sense damaged that they the, wouldn't work. Yeah. The way it worked. Yeah. So, so what Dr. Tennant believes is that all tissue that is misbehaving like that has a different electrical voltage. And I was, in a sense, at a low voltage system. And when he added voltage by using his instrument, I was able to uh, recover. You say it so changed I was the surprised. Field. It, changed it, changed the, it changed the electrical energy in that area. That's okay. obviously what happened. But I, I mean, this is on retrospect. I didn't expect the result. And uh, so, so the result was medically. What was the result? I mean, the result, however you got there, what well, was, the was that my uh, electrical system apparently was improved by the use of the instrument to the extent that all the tendons and the nerves were working just right again. And I can't, 
I mean, other than that explanation, I have none. Because so one shot deal. It was a one shot. You deal. didn't have to go back. No further no. treatment. No, no just no. one. Well, okay. So at this point, I'm saying, okay, if that's so effective for a knee, and he was talking about this workshop. I took the workshop, and I saw applications that I might use in medicine because I'm an ophthalmologist. There are pain syndromes, for instance, that I could treat. And I thought, you know, I'm going to learn how to use this. And he said, well, it's not that easy. You know, you don't just buy the instrument. At that time, you have to buy the instrument and have the course. The instrument was $3,500, and the course was $500. So altogether, it's about $4,000. But I went to Dallas to take his course, and it was a three-day course. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was finished, I was, you know, trained in using it. I had my instrument, which was a Russian instrument. Made so, in Russia. Made in Russia. Designed in at Russia. At that time. Yeah, made and designed in Russia. They, that was interesting because at that point in time, Jerry himself didn't know that the Russians didn't have a patent on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so later on, <laughs> and he's, being a, he's kind of electrical genius himself, so he understood that if he could make it, this instrument uh, with a Texas instrument, people were tired from that group he was living in Dallas so yeah. he went ahead and made his own instrument later but that particular instrument was the one I started with uh -huh. so what impressed me well here's what happened I want I have to tell you that uh, in summary I've treated over 550 patients 550 with what kind of injuries well and conditions? all kinds of injuries and and so, some that have caught my attention more than others because there were more dramatic recoveries than than you would expect. One of the instrument, one of the cases I had, one of the instrument uses, it was a fellow who, one of my patients, had fallen and been knocked out, and his only eye had a contact lens on it, a hard contact lens. In those days, that's how we treated, after you took the cataract surgery, there was only intraocular lenses in those days. We're talking way back. So I had operated on his only eye many years before, and fitted him with a contact, and he was wearing a contact on that lens. But here's the problem. When he fell over, he was unconscious, and he was taken to one of the local hospitals. And they either didn't look, or they neglected to get a history, but the lens was still on the eye. And oh, so man, this here's is not a I, good this thing. This is not Before a good thing. Before you tell us more, yeah. this is the cliffhanger. Yeah. You know, here's a patient, falls down unconscious, right. goes to the hospital, right. still has the contact lens right. on, only one eye, lots, of, lots at risk, lots at okay? Risk. And then we have electronics that yes. deal with this problem. Yeah. Um, this is Healthcare in Hawaii with Malcolm Ng, physician, faculty of John A. Burns School of Medicine. We'll take a short break, we'll be right back, and you'll find out what happened. Whoa! Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on thinktechhawaii.com. I hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. to discover what's likable about science. Aloha, I'm Chantal Seville, host of the Savvy Chick Show on Think Tech Hawaii. We are very excited to launch Mission Savvy Chicks that'll be here to help young women and girls achieve their dreams. Once a month, I'll be interviewing a special feature Savvy Chick to share her mission or dream. If you're a Savvy Chick with a mission or a dream and you'd like some assistance, I'd love to have you on my show. Be sure to write into Think Tech Hawaii or The Savvy Chick Show, and we'll see you soon. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I serve as senator from the Big Island on the Kona side, and I'm also an emergency room physician. My program here on Think Tech is called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'll have guests that should be interesting to you twice a month. We'll talk about issues that range from mental health care to drug addiction to our health care system and any challenges that we face here in Hawaii. We hope you'll join us. Again, thanks for supporting Think Tech. Yeah. We're back. We're live. We're here with Malcolm Ng, MD, faculty of the John A. Burns School of Medicine. And we're talking about electronics that deal with pain. Really exciting story. So can we go back to this patient yes. who fell unconscious, yes. had a, uh, had a, a, a contact, contact lens in his eye. Mm -hmm. This is dangerous business if you're unconscious. Right. And in walks the electronic pain machine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, here's what happened. His son called me and said, my dad's in a real bad way. And he gave me the story, and he said they finally discovered the contact lens five days after he ooh, was ooh. in the coma. So they took the contact lens off, and he's complaining. He says he's in severe pain. He can't see. He cannot see anything. And can you help him? I said, well, 
bring him to the office and let me take a look. So he came to the office and his son wheeled him in and I put him in front of what I called the slit lamp. The slit lamp is a particularly uh, good microscope of the eye and you put it up in front of the patient and you can see very high magnification what's going on. And what I found was that that only eye that he was able to see with before the injury and before the accident was totally denuded of any surface. The whole front surface, 100% of it, was missing. So it's what, because what, of the, the yeah, and what's wrong with that, that is that water goes in, fluid collects in the cornea, which is the front window of the eye, and that is all swollen and, and gray. He couldn't see anything except shadows. It mm, was terrible. terrible. And, and he was in severe pain. So I know the cu current technique. The current technique at that time was um, you would try to um, operate with uh, delivery of stem cells from somewhere else, from, another, from the other eye, for instance. And that's what I anticipated doing. So I talked to a couple of corneal experts. There, had, there happened to be a professor of corneal disease and surgery visiting at that time in Honolulu at that same weekend. So I asked him, he said, well, he's out of stem cells. You've got to go get, get stem One cells from eye. the other eye. Yeah, yeah. How's his other eye? I said, well, it's totally <laughs> blind, but he's got a normal conjunctiva and normal surface. He said, well, what you do is if he uh, still isn't healing, because he had been on antibiotics for almost five days more. So this is 10 days after injury that he hasn't healed, but 10 days from the injury time. But in any case, he said, you can operate, get those stem cells. And I said, yeah, I know, I know how to do that. So when he, his uh, son brought him in on a Saturday morning, uh, I looked at this, I found it, and then I said, okay, by Tuesday, if you're not healing well or not better, we're going to go to the operating room. And so be prepared to be staying in the hospital for a few days. So on um, Sunday morning, I woke up with this idea wow, maybe I could get lessen his pain if I go out and treat him. So I went out to Pearl City, the rehab hospital there, and I brought along this instrument. Now, I had the Russian instrument at the time, but do you want me to show you? Yeah, something? please. Well, the instrument I use now is the tenant biomodulator. Mm -hmm. Can you come it's in a on more, that? It's a more modern instrument right here. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. And what I did was I attached a probe to it. It's called the facial probe. The, the, the Russian instrument had an area where you could attach it also. And then this was so-called facial probe. And what I did was I held this probe above and below his eye. I don't touch the eye with it, but all around his orbit, I was, I was giving the electrical energy. And when you treat somebody with this type of system, you say, okay, now when you feel the stimulus, tell me what you feel, mild, moderate, or strong, and I never want you to have pain. So none, none of this is painful. So what I thought was I'll treat him, and that was Sunday morning. So I, I treated him above and below the eye and around the eye, and then I said, well, that's it. And it only took about half an hour at the most, maybe 20 minutes. So then I was through with that, and I told his son, though, come in on Tuesday, we'll take a look at him, we'll see how he's doing. Well, here's when I got the biggest surprise of my life. When his son brought him in on Tuesday, in a wheelchair still, and still not seeing well, but his first words to me was, Dr. Ng, you know what, eight hours after you treated him, his pain went away. His pain went away. I said, oh, well, good. Maybe the instrument worked for pain removal then. Terrific. Now, I took him out and put him on the slit lamp again. I put him in the same, where, same place I put him before. And this is where I got the shock of my life. Shock, I looked, is shock is shock. Not, my not, shock. Yeah. 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 Mental shock. It's the, right, it's the right word, though. I'm looking at the surface. It's 100% regenerated in two days. If you ask any ophthalmologist who's experienced with treating corneal abrasions like I have been or everybody else, they, ha they heal in a concentric manner. At the, at the very earliest, it would be five days or, or more. And they go from the outside in, so, you see, so the staining or the s lack of surface healing is, is last. The heal is the central part. Yeah. But this fellow had healed everything yeah. on the top. Yeah. So I said, well, 
I was going to transplant stem cells, no need. but you've done it. No need. Your own self, I mean, with the electronic, and I don't need to do the surgery. So I canceled the surgery. Had anybody done this before no. using this as device? As far as I know, never, never, nobody had used it in ophthalmology. So I, I was totally surprised but very pleased, and so he was very pleased because I told him, I said, once you have the surface cells on, then the cornea pumps out the water and you'll regain your vision, and sure enough, he went back to normal vision within a few, I would say it took almost two weeks before the but fluid. still, no need for surgery. But no surgery, and no pain, and he didn't have any pain. Yeah. So remarkable. So what, is, totally what, does that, remarkable. what does that teach us? It teaches us that electrical energy can be utilized not only to relieve pain, but maybe to promote healing in some somewhat mysterious manner. We don't know exactly, but I will tell you some of the, the theoretical reasoning behind it. And from that day forward, I was thoroughly convinced this was going to be a good adjunct for my practice, and I've been using it ever since. And it's worked. Yes, and, and one of the most, I'll get to a very important study that I did for the university, for the medical school, uh, under the auspices of the University of Hawaii uh, School of Medicine. But before I, I want to just talk to you about some anecdotal cases, we call it. So I found out it was very exquisitely helpful for any musculoskeletal pain. In other words, joints, tendons, muscles, anything that had been injured. Knees. Knees, especially uh, backs. Even backs. Backs are the hardest. <laughs> they take more than one treatment, usually. But... Uh, it's interesting because in my use of this, the word got out, so to speak, and I got a call from Ed Cadman, the former dean of the School was he, of Medicine. He, was he in school with you? He, he, he was, was a, Yale he was a school. Yes, he was a Yale Med uh, graduate like myself, but when he was dean, it was, I think, uh, five years or six years into his um, being the dean here at uh, John yeah. A. Burns, yeah. he called me up one day and said, Hey, Mal, I heard you got this uh, electrical instrument for use <laughs> in uh, injury. Uh, do you think it would work on a pulled hamstring? Because he I ran. Said, he was, he a, was runner. a runner. He yeah. was a marathon runner. Yeah, this yeah, guy was always into the running and the health. Man. And so, so I said, tell you the truth, Ed, I've never treated a um, hamstring injury, but, you know, come down to my office, wear your trunks, because I'm going to treat the backside of your thigh probably to get that hamstring what was interesting was he came down, and I used the instrument very similar to this. Or it was this type of instrument, and but not the small. No, not, not the, the small not the facial probe, but yeah. the regular instrument. This one, and I I used it. Uh, first of all, I detected where the field of energy was that was poor, and I've been able to do this now. If somebody has a pulled hamstring, I test myself and my instrument in a sense because I say, okay, lie down on your stomach. And I run this instrument, I set the voltage for a certain uh, quantity, and I run it over and I can f find the magnetic field. Wherever the pain issue is, it drags, it, it, it pulls. The instrument will not go smoothly across the skin there. Physically. So goes, physically. physically it, you can feel it. Yeah. So when I feel that, I say, oh, well, that's the area I'm going to treat. And so far, I've been pretty much correct on every prediction, which thigh of, of a two say a person lies down has only pull in one thigh or hamstring. So I treated his hamstring and um, he told me later, I, I treated only three times. And now he had plagued, been plagued for nine months, nine months with this injury. And he said, you know, it has really hampered me. Later on he told me that he uh, had relief of all discomfort felt actually normal after one treatment. <laughs> but I treated him at least three times. I remember it was at least three times. That's and amazing. I, I scheduled it over a period so, of, say, two weeks. What did he think? I mean, he's a medical, he was a medical What doctor. he did was go out and buy his own. <laughs> 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 he got an instrument right after <laughs> on his own because so, and learned how to use it. Let's look at your chart. You have a chart? About, yes, I have uh, a chart. Uh, and what does this tell us? Okay. Now, I did a prospective study. We only have a couple of minutes left. Okay, right. A prospective study where you randomize patients to treatment or with a sham instrument versus a real instrument. Mm -hmm. If you look at that chart, you're going to see that the blue line, that blue line happens to be the, the pain scale demunition. In other words, the, the response on the pain scale. We, we had them grade their pain from 1 to 10, and we, we percent, in percentage, you can see that there's a great drop in the blue line right away, 
as soon as you start the treatment. Now, what happened with the other one? This is a pink line. That pink line shows that that was a sham instrument. But in our study, we were allowing the patients to cross over to the other instrument and choose the other instrument at any time if they, after three treatments if they felt they weren't getting any response. So what that line shows is that there was no response and uh, all of them chose to cross over and use the correct instrument. And that where that red arrow is, is where I intersected with using the correct instrument or the real instrument mm -hmm. and the pain line dropped. Now, none of the uh, patients treated with the correct instrument or the real instrument uh, actually chose to, cho to, to change. Mm -hmm. All of them, and we had, they had results. Those, yes, yeah. and these were 20 patients, 10 in each group, and all of them had failed conventional therapy. So this was a waste, bu waste bucket group of patients which, which had no good treatment and were very much in pain for months to years. What about, you treated. said you had treated 550 patients. 550 different patients. What was the percentage of the, success? The of breakdown. That? The breakdown. Uh, overall, it's about 85%. About 15% don't. There are a couple of contraindications. I must mention those. One is, if you have a pacemaker in the person, you can't do it. They, if they have a pacemaker. Sure, electronics. Um, and uh, women who are pregnant, we don't treat those. Yeah. May, maybe more for medical yeah. legal than anything else. Yeah, yeah. We don't treat You'll them. take a chance. Yeah. And anybody who's already addicted to narcotics, you can't seem to get the proper responses. So so you found that in yeah. inductively, in, in, it doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, after using it uh, on the ones that actually were on narcotics, I was unable to get the results that I was able to get with any other. Mm -hmm. So I stopped treating anybody who was already on narcotics. We should talk about your book in yeah. closing, Healing yeah. is Voltage. Healing what is, what is that book? Can we this, take a, a shot of that book? This is a handbook okay. uh, by my mentor, Dr. Jerry Tennant. The one who you mentioned yes, originally. And, and what, in this book, he describes all the various clinical situations and where this might be helpful. And also, there's a good discussion in the back. But I want to bring up one more point. When I had an article published in the International Journal of Dermatology, they wanted to know why this worked. What, what is your theory? Here's what it is. Any tissue that is harmed or hurt, hurting has low pH, you call it potential hydrogen, it, that is also low voltage. So when you add voltage to that area by whatever means that you can. You change the pH. You change the pH and brings it up. And you also bring the voltage. And those two are linked. And uh -huh. that's when the pain Fabulous. Goes away. What a story. What a possibility. The, the possibilities are unlimited. Oh, Malcolm yeah. Ng, MD, physician uh, on the faculty of John A. Burns School of Medicine here on Healthcare in Hawaii, electronics that deal with pain. This story is not over. Thank you so much, <laughs> Thank <Malcolm>. you. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>